My name is Rob Latham. I've been working at Argonne for, for quite some time. Uh, I have three things I love in life. My family, pinball, and making applications go fast. Uh, and you know, applications go fast in two ways, right? They compute fast or they uh, do the I.O. fast. And compute fa the compute side, uh, applications have that covered, right? The computers get faster, there's more CPUs, there's, there's accelerators. That I'm not going to worry about that. Someone else is going to make the compute side go fast. But the I.O. side, that's a little, little bit of a different story. That needs a little bit more work, a little more love, a little more attention. How many of you here have an I.O. problem? Wrong. All of you have an I.O. problem. <laughs> uh, maybe not today, but at some point in your computing career, you're going to get to the point where you want to do uh, something I.O. related, and it's going to take longer than you want. Uh, you know, uh, your problem size will get bigger and bigger. Every year, your, your science will get with a finer resolution uh, every, every turn of the crank. Your storage will plot along at some measly rate per year. Uh, the peak bandwidth on theta is 240 gigabytes a second. Uh, that was the same rate for Mira. So here we have, we've changed the machine. We've got new architecture, CPU-wise. We have the same I.O. bandwidth. Uh, so what I'm going to do in this talk is give you a bit of, well, I've got a couple of different talks today. We're going to start off in this session talking about some of the fundamentals of the storage. And we're going to actually write some code here. So I hope you have your uh, tokens to get onto Theta. I hope you've been logging into Theta and using that machine, because we're going to do that. And I'm going to give you all five minutes to do these examples. So I hope you don't spend those five minutes finding your key fob. So I'm also going to try something a little bit different, uh, where I am going to talk a little bit about something, and then we're going to do these examples. And I'll talk about something, we'll do some examples. And uh, so. As you've probably heard from many speakers, we're going to solicit you for feedback. Please let us, let us, let us know how this works out, what we can do better. Uh, I, I'll tell you right now, I'm going to give you a bunch of C examples. And I'm sure many of you want to see Python or Fortran, but I don't know those languages, so you're out of luck. <clears throat> uh, no, we, we, can get you, we can get you in the right direction if you need that, if that's what you want to do. But um, uh, we're going to talk about the simple POSIX example on the bottom. I'll show you an MPIO example later. And, and parallel net CDF on top of that. And then Quincy later on will talk about HDF5. Uh, I have this Darshan logging uh, and characterization tool off on the side. We'll talk a little bit about, a little bit about that too and, and use that to see uh, what's going on inside of our, um, our software. We put all these examples up on a GitHub or a GitLab repository. So uh, this should have uh, a bunch of examples, uh, both uh, the ones we're going to work through in the slides, but also some extra examples if you need some more uh, inspiration or some more uh, examples of what's going on. Uh, I will walk you through the, it's called the array example, but there's also some, uh, a more fully worked out game of life example, uh, which shows a little bit more about how you might have different backends, the, um, the data structures used are a little more elaborate, but it just seemed like a bit much to go through for hands-on um, uh, in, 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 in the session. So uh, that's more like extra homework if you want to do that later. Um, Phil mentioned Globus, the data transferring routine we have uh, later tonight. Uh, so there's some, some write-ups there and some little test examples you can try out with that. In our example, we're going to deal with a fairly common scientific data structure, the multidimensional array. Now, of course, there are other data structures used in, in scientific computing, but uh, in the end, uh, the I.O. Um, interfaces, the best we can come up with really is a multidimensional array. So even our friends at the Flash group will use adaptive mesh refinement codes. We'll take that adaptive mesh data structure and, and convert it into a series of multidimensional arrays to store the data. We've taken a couple cracks at, at represent, representing graphs or um, unstructured meshes, but those are just a little bit too irregular to really give a, a good um, uh, I.O. optimization techniques, uh, any, any opportunities for I.O. optimization. When we think about the array, right, the, the real challenge is how do we decompose our, our working set? And in an array, you can decompose it row-wise, column-wise, chunk-wise. And all of those will matter based on your science. Uh, uh, the first example that comes to my mind is a, a colleague of mine was trying to get some good performance out of a volume renderer. And he was, he was kind of running through the file in a very, irrit a very um, not irritating way, a very complicated way. And so I suggested, well, why don't you just read the array you know, row by row, 
And well, it turns out if you try to apply a row of data, 2D row to a 3D volume renderer, right, uh, working on that math through a zero dimension is not going to work out. So uh, he needed to use 3D chunks. And so we came up with approaches that made that work better. In our examples, we're going to deal with row-wise decompositions. It's the easiest way to explain it. Uh, actually, we're going to, sorry, we're going to write row-wise, but we're going to read in a column. So you'll see a little bit of that. Um, uh, again, I don't know if you're, what your application is trying to do, but uh, hopefully you can take these lessons here and apply it to the more complicated uh, approach. The main focus of I.O. from my side for many, for many times, for a long time uh, in my career at Argonne, has been on the checkpoint restart I.O., the simulation I.O. An application will have, uh, uh, try to model the atmosphere or model a, a supernova exploding. And then at some point, because computers fail or, or allocations run out of time, you're going to want to write your state so that you can either uh, pick it up where you left off on the same machine or take that state somewhere else and, and, re and re continue your experiment or analyze your experiment somewhere else. In the early days of computing, the, the old vector craze provided operating system level checkpointing, and that was really neat. The applications just had to send a signal to the OS, and, and you got a state checkpointed, and you could pick it up where you left off. Uh, today, the story is much a little complicated in some regards because the OS doesn't give you any help there. But it's simpler in other regards because the application then can dictate what it puts in the checkpoint. And if you are not just worried about defensive I.O. for defending, um, saving your state and, and picking up later, those checkpoints could also be used for anal analysis and, and visualization. So uh, a, a canonical representation that would... Um, be able to, to restart on other configurations of the machines, right? If you, if you write a checkpoint file that only, uh, it, that assumes 100 processes or 1,000 processes or a million processes are going to read this file, you're limiting your restart um, opportunities. Check, checkpoint I.O. talks about a little bit, touches on a little bit of a question we had earlier today. Uh, why would you use collective I.O. versus independent I.O.? And um, this the notion of a, a checkpoint, a period of time when all the processes have finished their, their computational work and now need to save state, uh, lends itself very naturally to a collective routine. Just like in message passing with MPI, if you have a, an algorithm where every so often everybody needs to exchange data, you'll use a collective um, all to all, or you'll use a gather or reduction. You can't use those if your algorithm is more freeform. You have to use the independent routines. The same thing is true for I.O. Uh, there's an example of a, the Chombo code has a, a tree, and, and when leaves, when, when nodes are processing the tree, uh, they're going to each process their own leaf of the tree, and maybe some processes have six leaves, some processes have 100, but they're not really coordinating with each other. They're just going through and, and writing out their state. And so that's the case where we couldn't use collective opera operations. We had to use independent I.O. Uh, there are more opportunities for the library to help you out if, you if your application is naturally collective. And there may be cases where maybe if your application is unnaturally collective, that might help you out in the long run, too. Um, a lot of this depends on, on benchmarking and timing, and, and you want to see uh, where the trade-offs are. But I'll talk more about this, but there's, there's just the, the, the short summary is the library can help you out more in the collective case just because there's more context and there's more opportunities to transform the I.O. pattern. Whether you're doing independent or collective, you still need to think about what's in this checkpoint file. You need to, if you just dump some raw binary data, that might be adequate in many cases. You can think of a Python pickle or other serialization routines. But even in those cases, they're still storing a little bit extra metadata so that uh, when you restart, you're not just restarting from a random blob of binary data. There is going to be some sort of header describing the data. There may, be some, there may even be some structure in the data. If you have, uh, again, if you're going to use this file to, um, to study uh, your I.O. later, or to, to visualize your simulation, you may want to uh, have a little bit more structure than just a raw dump of, of memory state. We're going to talk a lot about storing into a file, because that's what we have on Theta. But as Phil mentioned, the I.O. systems of the future may be containers or key valves or document store. Or the point is, there'll be some thing that you're going to store that, that file. And hopefully, that's a small number of things. If you're resorting to one entity per processing element, you're quickly going to end up the case where you have tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of these things to manage. And sometimes just managing those problems is your I.O. problem. So, oh, sorry, managing those entities is your I.O. problem. So if you have a document, if you have an object storage system, maybe save your state into one object. If you have a file system, save your state into one or, or a, few no, a small number of files. 
Um, this is gonna make your uh, life a lot easier. So let's talk a little bit about some code, right? This is not gonna, we're not gonna run this code, we're not gonna try to do any queuing or anything, but let's write a little code. We're gonna write a little C code, maybe, yeah, sorry. I should say, write whatever you like, but I can only help you in C. And then allocate some memory describing a two-dimensional array. Now, if you look on Stack Overflow and the MPI questions, there's always uh, someone trying to figure out uh, how do I uh, describe this data when I did a, a for loop for these arrays? It's, you might think, you know, I've got 2D, so I'm gonna allocate an X, allocate an, for every, every Y, I, uh, I'm done. But uh, try to do allocation in one uh, single allocation. You'll, be, you'll have an easier time uh, writing that and, and sending that around to other processes. Uh, there is a, if you checked out the Git repository, there is a setup environment.sh file, which doesn't do much other than load a few modules you'll need later. Uh, for this example, you don't need to worry about it, but it's there for the um, parallel net CDF examples and, the, and then Darshan when we get there in two or three cases from now. All right, so let's take a look. Uh, if you got stuck and, and you need, or, or you don't want to work in C, or you just are doing something else, I have in here a, a solutions directory where I've worked all, well, there's a bunch of stuff in there in my copy, but uh, where I've worked all the examples out and you can go there if you, get, if you run out of time. And, and, but uh, try to do it on your own, because that's fun. And uh, we can look at the examples if, if, if um, because I'm gonna try to work through a bunch of stuff. And I'm still learning how much time to give for this, this, these exercises. Right, so there's not much we can do in C as far as uh, annotations. So the typical way to, to have an, an object in C or, or describe what you're doing in C is with a struct, right? We're gonna have, uh, it's a row by, by column array and we'll throw an iteration or parameter in that struct so we can say, you know, I wrote this checkpoint out, it's the hundredth iteration of my experiment. In this case, it'd just be the first iteration because we're not doing anything other than a little toy program. And here's a couple examples of the how we were imagining how you'd allocate the array, uh, a big malloc of x by y by, by integer. And, and again, we're doing a C, so we have to sort of understand the memory allocation pretty fundamentally. I suppose in Python that would just be something Silly, uh, some one-line trivial answer as, as uh, Jalene showed earlier. Uh, the hard way of doing this would be if you, as I mentioned, allocate it in a loop. Um, describing this second, this, this bad way would require creating some very sophisticated MPI data types. You can do it. You're going to have to. You're going to spend more time, more system calls, allocating memory, and you're going to have more overhead uh, running through this. Um, C is a caveman language. Uh, I don't make any pretension, uh, pretension about that, but it is an easy way to walk through memory and, and deal with pointers. Um, and, and so uh, as we're dealing with these, these arrays, they map pretty naturally to, to C arrays. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the POSIX layer, and um, you know, Phil was grumbling about this a little bit. Uh, if I teach you the hard way and then show you the easy way, are you gonna feel cheated? Like, why didn't I show you the easy way first? But I think it's pretty important to see all the different uh, mechanisms that are going on under the hood. Uh, even though there are a lot of new parallel file systems and new approaches, they're almost always gonna be a, a POSIX interface to those, uh, the open, close, read, write semantic. Phil showed you an example of that where no matter what you're talking to, you get the same simple system calls to work with. Now that's good and bad, it's flexible, it's everywhere. It's, it's good because it's flexible and everywhere. It's bad because this interface is 40 years old uh, and it, it doesn't have a lot of the concepts we think about in a parallel environment. You had the MPI tutorial on Monday or Tuesday. You thought about notions of, 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 of communicators and, and data type descriptions and the uh, context of, of people working, of processes working together to do a computation or, or a exchange of data. None of that is present in the, MP, in the POSIX examples here. Uh, you barely get hints. You can talk a little bit about what kind of workload you expect to do. I'm gonna write this file only. Okay, maybe the application, the library, the, sorry, the operating system can do something with that. When you write, only one process can really just say, uh, you, you get a file descriptor and the operating system only knows one process is writing. Now, a thousand processes are may, maybe writing to the file, but there is no way to indicate that through this interface. And uh, oh, good old Fortran. Uh, the portability problem is even more magnified in, in Fortran. The compilers will do things like pad records. There'll be some be zero or more padding bytes between these I/O records. Um, and this is this is literally all the Fortran I've ever written in, in 16 years of Argon. Um, 
because it's a little frustrating. Um, not much tuning and the portability. And then, right, portability, right? This is just raw binary data. Uh, there's not any sort of uh, self-describing or performance portability, uh, platform portability in this data. It's just, we just dumped out n bytes to this file. So even though it's a primitive interface and it's not very good for supercomputing, let's take a minute, five minutes, and, and write a little, do a little write. Right? Write a small uh, application to, um, in, in, your skeleton, in your skeleton code, there should be a, a number two example. There's a write data routine where you pass a file name in. Let's, uh, let's open that file, write the file, close the file. Uh, if you use the F open, the F write um, higher level, which is kind of funny to say high level in, in, in 2018, but you know, the, the standard I.O. calls from, from C, those will buffer the I.O. a little bit. Um, it's, not, it's gonna be a little, a little not as uh, natural a fit for what's gonna happen to the file system, whereas open, close, write, those are direct calls to the file system. Um, don't worry about reading it. We'll do reading in the next example. Uh, just take a few minutes and let's write out that, that array. We're going to write out the, the description, the metadata, maybe a header, and then the array. If you go to the array directory, you should find uh, the description code that we talked about in the last example, and then look, this is going to be two POSIX. Two and if you get stuck, if you, want, if you want to peek, if you want to just read the code instead of write the code, there's a solutions directory where I've done all these um, myself. There's a buffer create utility which just puts uh, a bunch of, instead of putting zero in the buffer, it, it counts through it. And when you look at the file in the end, you can see if it did what you think it's supposed to do. Um, obviously, a real science would do something else. Uh, but um, that's a, this is just a toy program. And that's uh, provided for you in, in util.h. Anybody want to keep working on this a little bit? I'm going to press on with the name. Urgent questions. Do you use go to? Do I use go to? Well, yeah, sure. Uh, I, absolutely. I know go to is considered harmful, right? Dijkstra caused everyone in C to flip out, and but if you are going to have uh, a bunch of error handling in one block, what are you going to do? Uh, you could. I mean, this is sort of a classic uh, C style. I mean, we don't have. We don't. Well, I guess sorry. Very recent C has exceptions, but you know. You're going to have to unwind memory. You have to cl close up any resources. Throw that at the end of a function block. Go there. Um, this is this is not the kind of spaghetti code that Dijkstra warned about and go-tos are considered harmful. It is a way of keeping everything done in, in one spot and is sort of the um, the closest thing we can come to to uh, a C++ destructor. Right? Uh, if you had uh, resource allocation as initialization, right? That's the C++ pattern. It's C, right? It's, again, caveman language, you're on your own here. Um, so yeah, you'll see some of that peeking through. Uh, but yeah, good. I, I, I'm, I'm happy to, I'm happy to f so entertain other ways of unwinding state at the end of a function where something goes wrong. It's, for this ex toy example, it's probably overkill, but if you had nested ifs and, and various clauses going on, uh, having one place to bail out is probably the right way to go. So hey, here we go. Um, What's the code doing? Yeah, we're, all we're going to do is we're going to, we're back here, we're going to write out an array, right? We're just going to take this, this two-dimensional array and dump it out to a file. And, uh, and then we'll be a little more sophisticated uh, later on. But I'm trying to um, demonstrate sort of with a simple example uh, some of the basic interfaces we have to I.O. And then we can build on top of those, in those simple interfaces, which uh, while, while not adequate for a parallel environment, uh, do sit at the bottom of the MPIO library and the HDF5 library and, and anything else you're going to be using. So I thought it would be useful to uh, do things the hard way, and then we'll do things the easy way. So if you've, run, if you've written this program, if you, look in the, if you look in the solutions or if you've written the example, you'll have a test file somewhere. Uh, maybe you did 
Have you read out the, 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 sort of the data about the experiment? Right? How big is the experiment? How big is the array? What count am I on? Then you, you wrote out a, your array. It, it's, it's, uh, you just get this much data. It, it's this big. That's what you tell the, the system call. And how do you know what's done? Well, you can cat the file, right? But it's, it's a binary file. You just wrote integers to it. Uh, so I use this tool called OD, octal dump, although now we're not going to dump an octal. But it looks at the file, and it tells you, hey, at offset 0 in the file, you had a 1. And then uh, at offset, well, 16, you had another one. So here, you can see that it's a 1 by 5 array. It's the first iteration. And the content in this data, the silly content we made up, is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, not very much data, because I didn't want to spend a lot of time on I.O. I'm focusing more on the interfaces. Sorry. Yeah. I'm getting an error. I'm pretty sure the code is, card is only basically the same as that. Uh, but I'm getting an illegal instruction. I'm not sure if it's, I have it here. The, the, uh, yeah, the, if, you, if you compile with the default compiler, you're going to have to run it on the computer instead of the login there. If you, if you want to run it on the login, you have to compile with GCC. GCC, okay. Uh, Thanks, Phil. So uh, I, I was trying to skip over the running part. Phil is right. Uh, if you run it on the login node, the tool chain on, on Theta will generate code for the compute nodes, not the login node. That's why you're getting a legal instruction. Thanks, yeah. Uh, that happens to me more often than I think. Uh, it speaks to a real challenge, though, on these machines when you try to do the regular configure, make, make, install, right? If your configure script is doing a uh, um, running a little test to see what happens, um, that's going to cause a problem. Uh, this is uh, with the, the blue gene, it was even worse. The, the architecture of the login nodes and the backend nodes was totally different. But uh, um, it's something to think about when you're writing your um, configuration scripts. But let's talk a little bit other ways people do I.O. Uh, and this will be an actual MPI job. And you should be familiar with MPI now. You're all experts after listening to uh, the MPI folks talk earlier this week. So you should be familiar with this idea. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to jump right into another hands-on example. Uh, now, in this case, instead of having one process writing the data, we have, now we're going to have many processes running. <clears throat> and these many processes, right, we can't do parallel I.O. through the POSIX interface. So, and this is a, an approach used by many applications. We're going to send all the data back to rank 0. Uh, and so we're going to gather with, with MPI call. We'll do a collective gather. And then rank 0 will do the writing of both the header and the array. And in this case, you'll have one row per process. Um, in this case, you know, this is a smaller, a smaller array than what you're working with. But in this case, you have five processes. Each process would write a different array, a different row to the array, or contribute a different row to the array. And rank zero does all that I.O. Now, there's some, there's some nice, this is, this is an approach that was used in real science codes for a long time uh, because, uh, maybe not recently, but having one process gather up all the I.O. simplifies a lot of, of problems, right? You don't have to worry about where to put each row in the array. You don't have to worry about uh, contention of the file system. Just one process writes it. And if you have a small amount of data, this might be, be just fine. Uh, certainly uh, the opposite, right? Uh, reading a small configuration file and broadcasting the result to everybody else, that's not a terrible approach. So you go back into write data. You can copy a lot of the code from your last example. I know we changed the write data routine a little bit, too. We are uh, passing in a communicator. Now, uh, you could, we're going to work on common world, but you could imagine a scenario where you have some processes that are, are I.O. tasks and some processes that are something else. Um, using common world, all, common world all the time is probably not the best approach. But for this simple example, it will be just fine. Yes? So the master model would work very well if it's a serial uh, file system, but it's parallel, it wouldn't be ideal, right? It wouldn't. No, um, if, if you had a small amount of data, it might be okay. If you, uh, if you, if you, if you profiled your code and you spent 99% of your time doing something else and 1% of time in I.O., maybe you take the shortcut and get through there. Uh, maybe you are on a system, and these systems uh, often deploy the compute hardware first, and then the storage comes later. Maybe you don't have access to, to very much uh, hardware. So while you're working on this, I just mentioned, Jalin mentioned a tool called Darshan. Uh, Darshan has been a tool we've used for a while to characterize I.O. of MPI applications. So we couldn't use Darshan to characterize a simple serial um, 
I.O. writer. But because we're using MPI here, we're calling MPI init and MPI finalize, we can, we can actually look at the Darshan log a little bit. And, and why, so there's, there's two lessons here on this example, sort of a way of, you could think about doing I.O., but I hope you don't do very often, but also a way of using, I want to, we're, going to, we're going to look at Darshan and, uh, and sort of understand what it's telling us. Yes, Stefan? So there are file formats that support yeah. parallel about the three. Yeah. File formats that support? You can put out a uh, separate parallel file yeah. segments yeah. and then collapse them together in a visualizer. Well, it's just running for us. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah uh, that, um, so you would have two different approaches. You could either um, canonicalize your data and make sure everything writes the same global state in the file or create many files and, and rely on your post-processing tools to manage that, that challenge, sure. Or any approach, if you have to output uh, in a time step, or a file for a time step, and then you output a lot of time steps, will there be a limit on the number of files you can have in the system should be time? Usually, usually there is a practical limit. However, uh, our colleagues at, uh, some, some of our colleagues are working on a file that has literally two trillion files, a, a, sorry, a, a particle tracing program that, that works on two trillion files which is a little bit more than most file systems were expecting. And so um, there's been some other libraries and techniques that have helped manage that problem a little bit. Uh, I would not recommend creating two trillion files. I would recommend creating five files, 10 files, but... Uh, and so there's two trillion files because you're tracking all those. It's creating two trillion files because in the end, when they want to figure out which particle did what, it was just easier to have to create the to treat the file system like a directory, and then when when they at the end of their experiment they realize they want to see particles ten, two million, and three hundred forty five thousand. So having the one file per particle per time step was a way of them then going back in time and figuring out what I need to know, what I need to know. And uh, I still think the approach is crazy, but they're getting science done with it, which is an important point. Uh, computational scientists are pragmatic folks, and if they get best performance by writing one file per process, they're going to do that and let the other person figure out the visualization challenge, the data management challenge. Uh, I, I would, uh, hopefully through lectures like this, we can make the, uh, we can have both the convenience of uh, a small number of files and good performance. Uh, Although, there's, is there an upper limit to how many files you have in the system? <laughs> if you close all the files as you open them, probably not. You'll hit some performance limits pretty quickly. Most files, uh, as Johnny mentioned, my LS never comes back. Um, if you have more than a few thousand files in a directory, uh, statting every one of those files and collecting file size information and, and properties uh, ends up being a pretty uh, stressful load on the file system. So. Uh, there are probably no hard limits, but in practice there are. I'll walk through the, the sort of a, the highlights of the solutions. You can look at the full solution uh, in the directory. <clears throat> uh, you know, everybody's got their own slice of the array. Everyone's got their own piece. And this, this uh, uh, buffer create routine is going to fill the array with some, num some data that's unique to each process. Uh, we're going to do a... An MPI gather here. Gather is a kind of elaborate routine. Um, if you, I don't know how much time you spent on collectives in the MPI session earlier this week, but you'll see this uh, buffer count data type tuple in many places in MPI. So the sender, every, every process in this communicator, in the com communicator, is going to send this array memory. It's, it's this many elements of size MPI int. The receiver is going to receive into its, um, its array. And then, uh, oh, that's not nprox. Well, uh, <clears throat> so this is the receiver contribution to this. And then, uh, is there a page two? Yeah. And then rank zero, right? If I'm if I'm rank zero, I'm going to do all the same stuff, except I'll write nprox data instead of x times y. All right. So, um, I have to skip these questions because we're running a little slow on time. If we want to understand the I.O., now that we can understand this because we just see two system calls, but if we were writing, if we had a more elaborate set of software, if we had a more complicated uh, software stack, we might not know immediately what's going on. Uh, 
so knowing what to measure is a big challenge. Do I time everything? Do I time just the I.O. parts? Where, is it, where are the I.O. parts? Uh, it, how do I do that timing without d perturbing my actual science? Right? Uh, if you are going to log every I.O. operation to a file, you will be able to understand pretty well what's going on, and, and, but you will have created another I.O. problem next to your original uh, I.O. problem. And then, furthermore, if we could somehow collect all the information from all the processes, we could understand more about what's going on. And when we, you know, these systems last about three or four, five years. Uh, and so procuring machines, it, go, it, will be, it will be a lot easier to procure the next machine if we can say something about the way the current machine, uh, the, way, the way applications use the current machine. So we have a tool called Darshan, which, we've, which now is about 10 years old. And its thoughts were, OK, well, we can't log everything, but we can log the important stuff. And we can't really log everything, but we can characterize it. We can keep counts of stuff. We can keep histograms. We can use data structures that don't grow with time, but instead are, are fixed sizes. So we can say, um, when was the file first opened? When was it closed? How many small writes and large writes that happened? And we can use these, these characterizations to really say a lot about what's going on in a given I.O. application. Uh, We've managed to keep, to convince most sites to just leave it on by default. And so every application that runs an MPI, uh, initialize and finalize, is going to get a Darshan, a Darshan log. Uh, our friends at ALCF and NERSC and KAUST and NCSA are all using it. And uh, you could install it on your laptop and, and run it there too. Um, so what is in it? Well, OK, sorry. How, how are we doing it? Well, we're going to have the idea of uh, wrapping every I.O. call in a, in a lightweight fashion. Uh, we're not going to do anything during the I.O. call other than twiddle some bits in memory. We'll defer all of the processing until shutdown time. When your application calls MPI finalized, that's when Darshan's going to go through and say, OK, well, you called open 10 times. You called MPI file open one time. We'll compress that file and then write it out to a log file. And, <clears throat> not, and hope, hopefully, by deferring all the work until MPI finalized, the science uh, that's been going on hasn't been perturbed very much. <clears throat> and by doing the write as efficiently as possible, even the shutdown time won't be greatly affected either. Once you have a Darshan log, it's, it's a bunch of binary data on a file system somewhere, but you can run a script to generate a report, and it will tell you things like a count of how many operations were made. I've made this many MPIO calls. They turn into this many POSIX calls. The access size histogram is really helpful to me. <clears throat> and then some counts of, of what, what happened, so in this case, you know, a nice big access, you know, we, many, a, a large count, but the exercise is very large. It's, it's, a, good, it's a good efficient file system, a good efficient, good efficient uh, I.O. access pattern. As I mentioned, we're collecting not just logs per process, but we're, we're collecting uh, every process as logs. And then we can do things like stuff this all into a database and ask questions about what's going on. Here's an example that our friends at, at NERSC did on an older machine. But the thought was, how many processes are spending a, a lot of time in metadata? And the metadata is, is things like opening the file, seeking around in the file, closing the file, things you wouldn't think of as, as doing I.O. And so we went through this file. We searched everything. We, we sort of defined, OK, well, if I'm doing 30 seconds of, of metadata and I'm using a lot of processes, uh, how, many, how many problems will I find? How many problem applications will I find? And you might think, well, 25% of your time in opening and closing files is, is pretty severe. There won't be too many here. Well, um, no, they found quite a few. And in fact, one of them was spending 99% of its time opening and closing files. So that might be a case where you might tap that developer on the shoulder and say, hey, you know, uh, I'm not sure what you're doing here, but we can do something better. Um, again, scientists are pragmatic folks. They're focusing a lot on the science part of things, maybe not worried so much about their I.O. parts. And so when you have this kind of always on uh, statistics collections, it gives us a chance, gives uh, sites a chance to proactively uh, in, in, intervene with these applications before they start burning a lot of CPU time uh, waiting for their I.O. to happen. So the way Darshan works is we've, we've talked to sites. They, they have it loaded by default. If you do a, a module list on, on Theta, you'll see Darshan in there. Maybe the version is a little bit newer than, than this report. But we have user's guides uh, at ALCF and at NERSC. And I think Oak Ridge has one, too. I, I couldn't immediately find it, so I didn't put it on this slide. Uh, I'm sure it's there. Uh, your job output is in, on Theta in, in this 
directory. Uh, and then there's a probably going to be a lot of them there because it's, it's one file per job that's run on Theta. So look for your uh, job ID instead of looking for the whole directory. It'd be a lot more productive that way. Uh, you can copy the logs to a directory to your working directory to make it a little bit easier to find it in the future. Um, and then to make the PDF, there's a tool called Darshan Job Summary.pl. Let's look for the log file. If you, if you manage to run the job, if that 64 node job got out of the way, you should be able to find a log file in the Darshan log. And um, I, I'm, I was just using X forwarding to get the PDF on my laptop. I see a mixture of Apple and non-Apple laptops, and maybe exporting doesn't work for everybody. Uh, you might have to generate the PDF locally, gen sorry, generate the PDF on Theta, and then copy it to your laptop to view it. But um, let's see if we can get a Darshan log for that little example we did for number three. So if your job didn't run, I just pushed a, a log file in the solutions directory. Uh, it's got a kind of a mouthful of a name. It's robel 3 master id blah, 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 so if you don't have a log of your own, you can use that one. That's in the solutions directory again. You have to write the, you know, update the Git repository. And then um, see if you can, you, can, you can generate a Darshan log out of that. It, everyone did the same thing, so the workload should look the same. So the Darshan file is only made at the end of the, the, the job. That's right. Uh, that gives us two interesting failure modes. Uh, and we found in both of these, uh, as we said, yeah, so your, bi your, your um, bioinformatics scripts aren't gonna work because they're not MPI jobs and, and so we're not gonna be able to get Darshan data out of those. If your job runs until wall time and then just dies because you weren't, you don't really care, you're just gonna run a while, you checkpoint periodically and you'll just pick up where you left off. You won't get a Darshan log there either. So you actually have to call MPI finalize to get this information. There won't be any log for, Darsh for the second for exercise number two because that wasn't an MPI job. That was a serial job. It didn't call MPI init or finalize, and so you won't see any Darshan data. But your, uh, your other job should have a log file once it runs. And if you run Darshan job summary on the, the script, you should get a log file that looks like this. And it will tell you that you opened the file once, it did two writes. This is not a very fancy file, but uh, the histogram talks about the small header that you, the small header that we wrote, and then a, a somewhat larger amount of data as you wrote all the array file information. You can see uh, 640 bytes of data, which if each array is 20 integer, 20 bytes, 32 processes, um, that all works out. Uh, 640 bytes is, is four bytes times five, because this is the, the header constants were pretty small, um, times 32 processes. Does the Darshan file just write out where you ran, or is it, where do you find it? All the Darshan logs are kept in the same place. Uh, on Theta, that is right here, uh, loose, theta, theta FS0, logs, Darshan, Theta, and then, then there's a forest of directories, uh, year, month, day, uh, and, then, and then you can finally, in that day directory, you'll see a million files. Uh, when you submit your job, you get a job ID, and that, that job ID is stored in the file name. So if you look for that job ID in the directory, uh, you'll get the file, the Darshan log that you're actually looking for. Would it be easier if it started where all the other log files are? I think what we, when we decided how we were going to do this, we figured most users weren't going to want to be surprised by a Darshan log file. and this way they would be able to either opt into it and to go find it, or we as IO people could go, go look for it for them. The notion was that these log files would always be there, and then uh, if we ever need to figure out a problem, we could go figure it out. Now, as over time, you're right, application people are getting a little more sophisticated, and they're like, well, I'm gonna look at the Darshan logs, and then go find it, and um, I think it was a, I think the design choice was to minimize surprise to the user. The idea was to trick them into running this and never want to disable it. <clears throat> so, um, by you know, sneaking it into the environment and keeping the log file somewhere else, the users can run a bunch of experiments and never see Darshan logs until they want to see them. If, yeah, so. Yeah, so here, if, we, if you do a module list, 
uh, I have uh, Darshan 3.15 right here, number 22, oops, right here. And we've, so we've talked to our site uh, folks to uh, add that to the default environment for everybody. The log files on Theta are stored in loose, Theta FS0. Loose is luster. I don't know why we couldn't spell two more, two more letters, but uh, loose, Theta FS0. And then you see, and then in here, there's, there's, there's a logs directory, and then a Darshan directory. I said that there is always an overhead to that. Like if I, so it, let's say I'm running an application on data, uh, by default it, I'm running it, so I would have to unload that module to no longer run to that. We think you would not see the overhead in practice. Uh, I mean, it would be there, but many, decimal digits out of the way in terms of, uh, so, and, and, and most applications, again, aren't really worried about finalized time. They're worried more about uh, convolution time and gradient time and, and checkpoint time. So um, if finalized takes 0.001% longer, uh, there's other things happening during shutdown that end up dominating the time more than the Darshan log production. Can you continue with, because there's subdirectories in 20. Yeah, okay, yeah, let's keep working. Yeah, right. Um, so we're in the year 2018. We're in the month of April. Oh, sorry, no, we're in the month of August. Sorry. Um, today's the third. All right, this is going to be a little painful. Okay, but there's a bunch of stuff here. You can see um, everybody who's running a job today gets a log file in there. Um, did I run a job today? I did not. So you're not going to see anything. So I didn't run anything yet, but you probably did. Now, um, around 4 p.m. today, you might look in, in, the fourth, in the fourth, because this is set up on GMT, I think. So um, nothing's in there right now. No one's run tomorrow. Uh, it's not tomorrow yet, but um, soon it will be tomorrow in, in London, and log files might start showing up there. Um, Phil and I were debating when does the time zone take effect, if it does at all. I, I don't think in terms of Darshan logs, it ever does. So um, that's going to be mindful. If you don't see it today, look in tomorrow's directory. Um, that sounds a little weird, doesn't it? Yeah. Darshan is really useful. Uh, I encourage you to, to, if you ever have a puzzle, if you're puzzled about your I.O. problem, you should look at it some more. We're going to refer back to Darshan many times in the MPI I.O. and parallel net CF examples. So uh, if you didn't get a chance to make a report and look at the report now, uh, don't worry, we'll, we'll do that some more today. I do want to talk a bit about uh, benchmarking because um, that ends up being uh, a useful uh, skill to have. When we get on these new machines, every, uh, we know from top 500 how many flops per second they can do. We know how much memory they've got. We know the compilers are going to do some stuff for us. And the I.O. side of things is a little bit uh, of a different story. So we might need to build up a mental model of what's going on. We might need to understand you know, how fast can I write this data? How big should this checkpoint data be to finish in a reasonable amount of time? The challenge, though, is um, when we write a little benchmark to, to, to scope our, our work, uh, that the storage systems are, are, are mechanical variable devices. There's ca there are caches throughout the system at the, the disk and storage le levels, and the, as well as in the client and server sides. And uh, it's a parallel job, so there can be some, some weird timing issues going on. I'll talk about each one of those uh, in, in, as we go on. So when you store uh, some, a byte to memory or you compute uh, a mem uh, 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 the product of two, of, two, of two factors, once you measure that, that's going to basically be how fast your CPU is. The, the, the CPUs running on these machines aren't doing power saving or anything like that. They're just going to be running as fast as they can to get you the science you need. Um, we can, you can even use this to, to sort of determine how big your register space is, your register file, your L1, L2, and, and swap sp memory spaces are. And you can see that if I multiply an array of, of, of a million integers, uh, it's very fast if they fit, sorry, uh, you know, 64 integers are very fast. Uh, a, a thousand integers is a little bit slower. A million integers is, is even slower still because I'm going out to main memory. And then uh, a billion integers probably has to hit, well, today it's not going to still be main memory. Um, 10 billion integers might go out to swap space. Um, you, can, you can run these experiments and you can, start, you can sort of see, okay, if I do this, if I do this, this happens. But with storage, uh, it's, again, as Phil mentioned, a, a bit different. Uh, they are sometimes spinning platters. They are gonna, there's going to be uh, caches involved. 
And there's more than one process involved. You do not get dedicated time to the storage system. Our queue system, as we've observed today, gives you a machine to run on or some number of machines to run on. But we don't yet have a way of saying, I also want to run on this much storage. We probably should, and that's, a, that's an honest efficiency in, in the system, system software of these machines. But today, the, state of the, the fact of the state is that uh, storage systems are, are shared in contentious uh, resources, and as a result, uh, you can run an experiment many times and see quite a bit of, of variation. Uh, also, as storage systems get older, they get slower. Uh, we had a storage system, uh, the storage system we have on, on Mira starts off at, at performance X, and as it gets full, it gets worse and worse over time. And so, uh, knowing that the machine was deployed with X gigabytes per second of storage space isn't very helpful today, you know, N months in the future. You need to know the performance now, and so running a quick benchmark to figure that out is, is helpful. Um, now, when I say quick benchmark, it can't just be a one-off because, again, things are going to change. Um, running, running a few thousand experiments that, that each take about a minute would be great. Uh, the, the reality is, is, though, that compute time on these resources is, is, content, is contended for, and you, you bid for, you write proposals, and you get a certain number of hours to do your science. Uh, in, the Insight project is not bending over uh, to get uh, backwards to give us any uh, time on these systems. Uh, I know because I wrote a proposal to get time on these systems to do benchmarking, and they said no. So uh, you don't get a lot of time to run uh, these tests. So we have to sort of trade off uh, the different si the realities there. In our direct, in our hands-on repository, is an example called Variance that, that uh, we put together. If you run that example, I don't, I don't have time to, to show you the example, but. I encourage you to try it out. It's not doing much. It's opening a file, writing some data, closing the file. And, and that simple example will vary quite a bit. It won't take very long, but you'll see 10% um, you know, variation, even in this simple example, uh, on a simple test. Because so you want to sort of run it and, and see for yourself, I encourage you to see just how variable things can be. Um, when you run a benchmark, uh, a couple things to watch out for. Often your data will end up in cache if you're not careful. And so you'll get this really fast result. You'll be really excited, like, wow, I did uh, a terabyte per second of I.O. No, I guarantee you, you did not. Well, you, you, you did, but not in a practical sense, right? Because uh, as you scale that, that load up to an actual science job, which is going to run on a significant fraction of memory on the machine, you won't see a terabyte, of per second, a terabyte of data per second. You'll see a few hundred gigabytes at best. I guarantee you, vendors are not giving us extra storage performance. They are trying as hard as they can to hit the numbers that they, they quoted in the bid and not one gigabyte per second more. So uh, the, the published performance on Theta, I think, is 240 gigabytes per second. Uh, if any benchmark you have says you got 250 gigabytes a second, that is not going to happen. You need to rethink your problem size a little bit because that's, uh, that isn't really how it is. In, yeah. you, you, you probably benchmarked the... the uh, the burst buffer, the SSDs that are on Theta. You probably benchmark the memory uh, on the server VFS cache. Perhaps you benchmark the, the RAID device, the RAID controller uh, buffering or the luster caching something. Uh, it's actually quite challenging to exhaust all these caches. And, and challenging also means lengthy. So uh, that has been a, a big headache uh, in terms of really understanding what is the IO performance we're going to get in these large experiments. I couldn't think of the right word for this. Uh, it, it's kind of a variable, it's kind of a, a, a ganging out problem, but the, the thing is, if you're going to time your I.O. experiment, and this is in this simple figure, there's three processes running. Uh, one process got an early start and finished pretty fast. Uh, one process got a little bit slower start, took a long time. Which one should you use? Which, which time is the, is the answer? Now, most of the, if we, when, when, when we're doing benchmarking as, as I.O. people, we'll typically use the, long, the slowest one. That's the number that actually matters for us. The, your science can't continue until you've finished I.O. And finished I.O. means even the slowest process has to finish. Another thing to get around this, this uh, staggered start problem, and maybe you put a barrier around your, your area of interest. MPI barrier is not perfect. Uh, there's no guarantee that processes leave the barrier at the same time. But it does sort of get everybody synchronized a little bit. And if you look in the variance example, you'll see uh, both of those. You, you'll see uh, both a, a barrier around the time and uh, a reduce to get the maximum time that any process took. So in our uh, hands-on examples, there's also a game of life example. Uh, I didn't want to spend a lot of time on that because it was tough to sort of run the examples and talk about it at the same time. But <clears throat> this is a good example of uh, a little more sophisticated use of MPI data types. You can see. Uh, 
I think you talked about the game. Did you talk about the game of life on, on Monday or Tuesday? Yeah. So when you're describing the I.O. region, you have to worry about ghost cells. You have to describe uh, a little bit differently. Oh, uh, the use of their API is a little bit more sophisticated than this toy example we wrote. So in this case, there'll be a, a POSIX, an MPI, and a parallel NetCDF uh, uh, implementation of their um, checkpoint and, and restart routines. And that's about all I really want to point out about, about that. Uh, I would encourage everyone to uh, go get some lunch. And when we come back, we'll, we'll talk about actual parallel I.O. I know we, left, we laid a lot of uh, foundation here for um, the parallel I.O. part. But I think uh, I'll be calling back to a lot of these, these ideas and concepts by, by ways of contrast uh, when we come back at 1.30. <laughs>